So we're on uh, chapter six, Belgrade. This is my beautiful balcony, downtown, beautiful Chicago. Uh, this is one of the most interesting chapters of this book that's pretty much interesting from start to finish. But this is a lot of combat. There's a lot of combat in the whole damn book, but here goes. Chapter 6, Belgorod, page 169. On a hot evening in the summer of 1943, we found ourselves once again in the immediate vicinity of the front. Belgorod had recently been retaken by the Russians, who had set up their advanced positions just beyond the town, inside our own lines. The front, which ran through Belgorod from Kharkov to Kursk, was more or less quiet. The campaign, which had continued almost without a break since our withdrawal from the belgorod veronezh kursk triangle, had been exhausting. The Russians were now catching their breath and collecting their innumerable dead before launching an even stronger attack against our positions in September. Kharkov had remained in our hands after the slaughter at Slavyansk, and the Russian breakthrough on our southern front had finally been stopped somewhere near Kremenchuk. The Soviets had regained some of their strength and had forced the Germans and Romanian troops to withdraw from the Caucasus in the Kalmuk Plain. They had also pushed us back from the Donets. However, the situation was not yet entirely in their hands, and strong counterattacks from our side often broke their frantic thrust. Belgorod, Kharkov, and Stalino all figure prominently in any account of German counterattacks. 60,000 troops took part in the Battle of Belgorod. I was one of them. 18,000 Hitler youth, Hitler Jukem, had also arrived, these young men, from Silesian camps to receive their baptism of fire in this unequal combat, in which a third of them ended up losing their lives. I can remember their their arrival very well in brisk columns, ready for anything. Some units carried flags with inscriptions embroidered in gold letters. Chulgen Lloyd, or the world belongs to us. Platoons of machine gunners arrived, and infantry regiments loaded with bandoliers stuffed with grenades, and motorized regiments with all their heavy equipment. The plain was covered with soldiers. And for the next three or four days, more and more and more came. Then everything quieted down. By regiment, section, and group, we were all directed to precise locations where we settled to an armed watch. Once again, I speak as though we knew of the impending, the impending attack. In fact, we engaged in these preparations as part of the normal routine. As in the past, I and my comrades were used for a thousand and one chores, which reminded us of the old days in the Rollbahn. It was suffocatingly hot, and the dried yellow grasses of the steppe did not hold down the dust, which was stirred up in clouds by the slightest movement. In the evenings, we sat beside enormous campfires and talked or sang. The front was some 50 miles away, so fires were permitted. There was plenty of time for an abundant correspondence with Paola, and I thought about her constantly. Then, one afternoon, we were assembled for distribution of ammunition. Each man was given 120 cartridges and four grenades. Ten of us, nine men and one non-com, were organized as an assault group. Hals was a machine gunner, one of two men with FM Spandau machine guns, each with a number two man. There were three men with rifles, one of them me, two grenadiers armed with automatic and heavy bags of grenades, and a non-com. In total silence, and with every possible precaution, we were led to a shelter near a large farm, right behind the front, and an armored section of the Gross Deutschland was next to us, with tiger tanks and heavy howitzers pulled by tractors and camouflaged by real and artificial leaves. We walked past a table set up near one of the buildings, and a fat clerk took down our identification numbers. At another table, a lieutenant in the cavalry was studying a map, surrounded by other Panzer officers and a couple of non-coms. With painstaking precision, we were taken from the farm to the place marked for us on the map, suddenly at the edge of some woods. 
I recognized the wide communication trenches which led to the front line, and I think we all had the same thought. Now we're in for it. All around us, other groups were taking up their positions. We formed part of Company 5, which was sent down a communications trench, cutting in at right angles and leading to the brush where the trees stopped. The engineers must have really sweated cutting through all these roots. Everywhere, sections were settling in, improving and deepening their shelters. It was about 6 o'clock in the evening, and the heat of the day was beginning to slacken off. We followed the trench out of the woods and across a range of low hills with wooded crests. An officer, with his eyes glued to a map, showed us the way. We turned off to the right, which brought us back under the trees where the heat was trapped and much more impressive than out in the open. Everywhere men pouring with sweat were jostling each other, looking for their positions. Finally, we came to a large half-covered shelter packed with young men soldiers from the Hitler Youth. Halt! shouted the non-com who had been leading us. You'll split up here and take your positions when the order is given. Your felt fable will explain what's expected of you. He saluted and left us with the Hitler youth who were sitting on the ground or squatting in their haunches, talking gaily. I went over to Halls, who had just put down his MG-42 machine gun and was wiping the sweat from his face. Hell, he said, I was better off with my Mauser. This damn thing weighs a ton. I'll be with you, Halls. It seems we're part of the same group. We compared left hands, which had both been stamped 5K8. What does that mean? Asked Olenshine, who had just come up. A group number, Gerfreiter, said Halls. If you're not in the 8th, we don't know you. Olenschein looked anxiously at his hand. Damn, I'm 11. Do you know what that means? Not I, said Halls. But ask Corporal Lenson. He must have an inside tip or something. We're going on a picnic, Lenson said, laughing, secretly displeased that his rank did not let him in on the secret of the gods. One of the Hitler youth came over to us, as pretty as a ripe young girl, do the Soviets hang together in combat? He asked, as though he were inquiring about an opposing football team. Extremely well, said Hall, sounding like an old lady in a tea room. I was only asking because I thought you looked experienced. He said, we were all about the same age. Let me give you a piece of advice, young man, said Lenson, whose tiny promotion was, after all, worth a little something. Fire on anything Russian with the least without any hesitation whatsoever. The Russians are the worst sons of bitches the world has ever seen. Are the Russians going to attack? Well, Shine looked very white. We'll surely uh, attack first, said the beautiful young man in the Hitler Youth, whose Madonna face was incapable of ferocious expression. He walked back to his gang of boy companions. Do you think someone will tell us what all this is about? Lenzen said in a voice loud enough to be overheard by the felt fable. Shut up! Shouted a real veteran, sprawled full length on the ground. You'll know soon enough where you they're going to send you in. Hey! One of the Hitler youths took him up. Who's the shit talking like that? You shut up too, you crapheads! Said the veteran, an old man in his 30s who must have been taking it for several years now. We'll have enough of listening to you when you get your first scratch. One of the young uh, Hitler youth got up and walked over to the veteran. Sir, he said in the assured voice of a law or medical student, will you please explain your defeatist attitude, which is sapping the morale of everyone here. You just let me whistle my own tune, said the other, who appeared unimpressed by a flowery turn of speech. But I, I'm afraid I must insist on a reply, said the young man. And I say you're a bunch of fatheads who won't begin to think until you've been cracked in your nice little skulls. Another of the young Hitler boys jumped up as if he'd been shot. His features were regular and firm, and his steel gray eyes reflected an unshakable determination. I thought he was going to rush the older fellow who wasn't looking at anyone. Do you think we're still tied to our mother's apron strings? 
GPS and a voice as steady as his look. We've been through months of training too, and we're just as tough as you. We've all been in the endurance squads. Kromer, he said, turning to a friend. Hit me in the face. Kromer jumped to his feet, and his strong, nervous fist struck his friend in the mouth. The latter staggered for a moment under the impact of the blow, and then walked over to the veteran who decided to look up. Two streams of bright red blood were pouring from the mouth of the young Lo and running down his chin. Fat heads like me can take it just as well as bourgeois shits like you. All right, said the veteran who decided against coming blows ahead of H hour. You're all heroes. He turned away and tried to whistle. How about writing to your families instead of squabbling like this? Instead of Feld. Mail will be collected in a little while. That's a good idea, Paul said. I'm going to write my parents. I had a letter to Paula in my pocket, which I've been carrying around for a couple days, waiting for a chance to finish it. I added a few tender sentiments and sealed it. Then I wrote to my family. When everyone was afraid, he thinks of his family, especially his mother, and as the moment of the attack drew closer, my terror was rising. I wanted to confine something in my anguish to my mother and felt that somehow I could do it in a letter. I had always found it difficult to confide in my parents face to face, even the slightest of crimes, and had often criticized them for failing to help me, but on that occasion I was able to express myself. Dear parents, especially mama, I know you must be quite angry for me for writing you so little. I have already explained to Papa that life we lead here leaves almost no time for letters. This was not strictly speaking true. I had written to Paul at least 20 times, only once to my family. At last, I want to ask your pardon and describe something of my life here. I could have written to you in German, Mama, because I'm getting much better at it. But it's still easier for me to write in French. Everything here is all right. I've finished my training. I'm a real soldier now. I wish you could see Russia. I can't imagine how huge it is. The wheat fields near Paris seem like tiny gardens compared to what we have here. Now it's as hot as the winter is cold. I hope we won't have to spend another winter here. You wouldn't believe what we went through. Today we moved up to the front line. Everything is quiet. It seems as if we just come here to relieve our comrades. Hals is still my best friend, and I have a good time with him. I think you'll like him when you meet him on my next leave, unless the war is over before then and we're home for good. Everyone thinks it must be going to end soon, but we can't have another winter like last one. I sealed my letter, and together with the one to Paula, handed it to the postman. Hals, Olenschein, Kraus, Lenson. They all had letters, too. Everyone was quiet on that summer evening in 1943. After dark, of course. There would be a few clashes between patrols, nothing more, but that's war. Some of us were rounded up to distribute supper, which we ate late. We were forbidden to touch the few cans we had, but they constituted our total reserve. Dusk was falling when the Feld responsible for our section waved us over to him. We were soon listening intently as he told us what we would be expected to do. He had a large map of the district on which he showed us the points we should attain, taking every precaution. When the order was given, we should be prepared to protect the infantry, who would quickly join and then pass us. We were given a list of rallying points and other details which I only partly understood and advised to rest, as we would not be called before the middle of the night. We stood and stared at each other for a long time. Now we knew we were going to be a part of a full-scale attack. A heavy sense of foreboding settled over us, and the knowledge that soon some of us would be dead was stamped on every face. Even a victorious army suffers dead and wounded. The Fuhrer himself had said that. In fact, none of us could imagine his own death. Some would be killed, we all knew that, but each one imagined himself doing the burying. No one, despite the obvious danger, could think of himself lying mortally wounded. That was something that happened to other people, thousands of them, but never to oneself. Everyone clung to this idea, despite fear and doubt. Even the Hitler youth, who spent years cultivating the idea of sacrifice, couldn't consciously envision their own ends occurring within the next few hours. One might be exalted by a grand idea based on a strategy of lecture, and even be prepared to run large risks, but to believe in the worst is impossible. Finally, night came. A summer 
night that was really soft, which brought with it a fresh breath after this torrid day. Everywhere free of the war, people must have been stretched out in the grass besides their houses, enjoying the season with their friends. Sometimes when I was small, I used to take a walk with my parents before going to bed. My father believed one should enjoy summer evenings to the maximum and kept me out until the, my eyelids drooped with sleep. Howls pulled me back from my thought. My dear Sager, be sure to look out for yourself when we get going. It would be too stupid to get killed just before the war's over. Yes, I said that would be stupid. All of us were haunted by so many thoughts, the conversation was impossible, and each of us was obsessed by the particular question, how shall I come through this time? In the depths of the covered shelter, one of the Shulgenlun was playing, playing, playing on his harmonica, and the voices of his companions uh, joined softly in the melody, then the sound of gunfire made us jump. Here we go we thought. But everything quieted down again. Lindsay came up to us. Listen, the first Soviet line is less than 400 yards from here. The fell just told me. That's really not very far. But it's not too bad either, said the veteran of a little while ago. At least we can sleep in peace. At Smolensk, the Palfalf's hole were less than a grenade's throw from ours. No one answered him. I'm commanding group six, and I have to get right under Ivan's nose to keep him from moving when the assault troops begin their attack. You can imagine. We'll have it about the same, said the sergeant who would lead us. According to what I've heard, we'll be right in line with one of their positions. We listened attentively, hoping that our part of the Enterprise was not going to be too dangerous. But the um, Russian scouts are sure to see us, cried Lindbergh, horrified. That's crazy. That will be the hardest part of it, but let's hope the night is dark. Also, we've been advised not to fire before the attack, to get into position without any noise. Don't forget mines, said the veteran, who in fact had not gone to sleep. The ground was checked for mines by details from the distant air plenarian battalion insofar as possible insofar as possible sneered the veteran i like that all the same you better be careful if you see any wires don't go tugging them if you keep on like this lenson shouted in a threatening voice i'll put you to sleep until the attack he shook his stubby fist under the old man's nose the veteran only smiled but didn't say anything what if we run right into Ivan, asked Grenadier Kraus. Then we'll have to use our guns, won't we? Only as a last resort, the non-com answered. In principle, we're supposed to take them by surprise, knock them out without any noise. Without any noise? What do you mean? With the butts of our guns or our spades? Asked Halls anxiously. Spades, bayonets, anything. We've got to get rid of them. That's, that's all, and without raising any alarm. We'll take them prisoner, murmured young Lindbergh. Are you off your rocker, said the non-com. An assault group can't take prisoners during a mission. What will we, what will we do with them? Hell, said Halls. You mean we'll have to skewer them? Lost your guts? asked Lenson. Hell no, said Halls to show that he was a man, but his face was white. I glanced at the spade pick hooked to my big friend's waist. Then we had to stand up so I helped when a captain and his group could get through. Where where are we exactly? Young Lindbergh asked naively. In Russia! said the veteran. No one smiled at this feeble joke. The non-com tried to give us a rush idea of our position, some three miles northwest of Belgorod. I'm going to try to sleep, stammered Halls, who was clearly shaken by all these preparations. We lay down side by side without bothering to underdo our bedrolls. The steel of the Spandau machine gun, which Halls had set up, pointing down the length of the trench, gleamed with a dull luster. Sleep was impossible, not because of the discomfort of a night outdoors trapped into all our gear, we'd done that many times before, but because of our anxiety to be able to lay ahead. Hell, I'll have plenty of time to sleep when I'm dead, 
officer Grenadier Kraus in a loud voice. He stood up and pissed against the wall of the trench. I lay awake for a long time, thinking and thinking. Finally, I did sleep for about three hours, and I was wakened by the distant sound of a motor. My movement woke Halls and Grumpers, the other grenadier, who was lying beside me with his head on my shoulder. What's the matter? Grumpers groaned sleepily. I don't know. I, th I thought maybe they'd call us. What time is it? Grumpers asked. I looked at my school watch. 2.20. What time is dawn? Asked young Lindbergh, who hadn't been able to sleep at all. Probably very early this time of year, someone said. The sound of engines continued. If those fucking drivers, if they keep this up, they'll wake every one of the goddamn Ruskies. We tried to go back to sleep, but couldn't. About half an hour later, we heard a muffled noise of a bustle and commotion just beyond the walls of the covered shelter. In the darkness, we guessed that we were listening to some fellows collecting their gear. We all turned toward the sound, trying to grasp what was happening, when a feld appeared, wearing camouflage. Groups eight and nine, he asked in a low voice. Present, answered the two group leaders. You'll be leaving in five minutes by way of access C, and will proceed to your respective positions. Good luck. He pointed to a small sign, scarcely visible in the darkness, marked with the letter C. All our reflections came to a dead stop, and our brain emptied as if we'd been anesthetized. Everyone grabbed his gun and checked the critical points of his harness and strap, as Hauptmann and Captain Fink had taught us, especially the chin straps of our helmets. Hals lifted the big FM machine gun onto his shoulders, and Lindbergh, which was his number two man on the machine gun, slipped his slender silhouette in beside the man he was supposed to serve. Only the veterans, our second machine gunner, behaves as if he'd forgotten the object of all these preparations. His movements were not marked by the febrile haste which Kerak acted the rest of us. He knew all this from before. He propped the heavy, the heavy FM machine gun against his leg and waited for the order to move out. I hope you're in good shape, he said to his gun, grinning sardonically. Group 8, called the sergeant, sounding as if he struck by a sudden electric shock. After me and silence. We took exit C, and sticking close together, followed the trench to the forward positions. Our non-com was at the head of the column. Behind his group came Grumpers, the grenadier, who was about 22 years old, then Hals, just past 18, and Lindbergh, not quite 17, and our three gunners, a Czech of indefinable age with an unpronounceable name, a Sudeten of 19, whose name ended with an A, and me. Right behind me was the veteran with his number two man, another terrified boy, and finally Grenadier Kraus, who must have been well into his 20s. We moved out in good order, exactly as we'd been taught at Camp F, where we'd sweated so hard. Indefinable noises reached us, coming from either the Russian or the German lines. We crossed several trenches, jammed with troops who were still half asleep in the warm summer air before climbing out of our own trench in the middle of the woods. Young Lindbergh, who was loaded down like a donkey, slipped on the earth embankment. And the magazines of his Spandau machine gun he was carrying clashed together. The non-com grabbed him by his straps and helped him climb up. Then he glared at him furiously and kicked him in the shin. We walked to the edge of the wood in a single file. The non-com stopped short very suddenly, and we all more or less piled into each other. It's darker than Hades here, the veteran muttered in my ear. It seemed to me that our guide, having signed us up to stop, was now going on ahead. We stayed where we were, bent double, waiting for an order to proceed. Despite our best efforts to keep quiet, we couldn't avoid a certain amount of metallic clatter from all the weapons we were carrying. The non-com came back and we sat out again, walking forward another short distance to the foxholes at the edge of the woods where our scouts were waiting, as quiet as snakes. We threw ourselves down onto their short trench. As flat as you can, whispered the sedate, who in principle walked just ahead of me, pass it on. 
One by one, we left the last German positions and crawled out onto the warm earth of no man's land. I kept my eyes glued to the hobnail soles of the Sudeten's boots, trying nervously to keep in sight all that couldn't be seen of my closest companion. From time to time, the air ahead of me would darken with the looming shape of a comrade who had to climb over some obstacle. At other moments, the soles of the boots ahead of me would suddenly stop inches from the end of my nose. Then I would be gripped by horrible anxiety. Maybe the Sudeten had lost sight of the fellow in front of him. A moment later, he would begin to move again, and the instinctive confidence I felt as part of the group would unknot my throat. During such moments, even naturally reflective characters suddenly feel their heads empty, and nothing seems to matter except the dry, cracking stick pressing into one's stomach, which one must somehow crush and pass over without making a noise. A new hitherto unsuspected acuteness sharpens every sense, and the tension seems pressing enough to subdue one's wildly racing heart. We inched slowly forward across that damnable Russian soil, which all of us had already trampled more than enough. We had to crawl across a short stretch of light sand against which we would show up too easily, crushing under our bodies a mat of foamy creepers, which we took at first for Russian barbed wire. Then we came to a mossy hollow where we stopped for a moment. Our sergeant, who had a very good sense of direction, was going over the route in his head trying to fix our position. The hollow reeked with a pestilential smell, when we began to move again, I was startled to see two motionless figures lying in the sand two yards to our right. I pointed at them, nudging the veteran, who looked and grabbed his nose. With a shock of horror, I, knew, I understood. We had just passed two corpses, which were quietly rotting as they waited for burial in a common grave. We seem to have crawled as far as China... About half an hour after we started, we came to the first Russian wire. We waited with beating hearts while our first men opened a precarious package. Every time we heard the cutters snap, we expected to see a spray of dirt shooting up from an exploding mine. Our faces blackened with soot from the canteen kettles were pouring with sweat, and the tension was so great we certainly must have aged several years during the few minutes we needed to control to crawl under the Soviet wire at a speed of about 15 yards an hour. When we had all made it through, we stopped for several moments and huddled together. Every one of us was trembling. We could hear faint sounds from the Russian forward positions. We rolled our eyes at each other and understood without words that we all felt the same way. We crept forward in about another 20 yards to a stand of low scrub or tall grass. We could hear the sound of voices and knew beyond a doubt that we had reached the first Russian line. Suddenly, we were staring incredulously at an almost invisible figure. A Soviet reconnaissance man who was bending over a hole which undoubtedly contained some of his comrades. We all almost stopped breathing and slowly lifted our guns, looking at our leader, who seemed to have frozen, and then at each other, with a look beyond expression as the Russian walked slowly toward us. Then he turned and turned away and walked back. Our sergeant pulled a knife from his belt. Its blade flashed white for a moment before he thrust it slowly into the ground in front of Grumpers, the grenadier man, pointing to the Russian with one finger. The grenadier opened his eyes enormously wide and looked with horror from the Russian to the knife to the sergeant. The latter gestured him off as Grumper's quivering hand clenched around the knife handle. With a final, quiet look of supplication, the grenadier began to creep forward. We followed the progress of his dark shape with an anxiety which made us clench our teeth to keep from crying out. Then he was lost in the darkness. The Russian was still talking to his friends as if the war were a thousand miles away. He took a few more steps. We could hear more voices a little far off. 
For a few long moments, each of us forgot his own existence. The Russian walked toward the spot where Grumpers must have hidden and turned back. As he turned, a second silhouette rose up behind him. Grumpers covered the five yards that separated him from his quarry in one jump. The Russian whirled around. We heard a rough cry and the sound of a struggle. From a hole a short way off, we heard Russian voices. Then we were able to distinguish the silhouette of our grenadier rolling on the ground and hear the sound of his voice. Hilfe, Kameraden! The Russian jumped to one side, and the sound of his machine gun tore into the quiet of the night. As its white stripes striped the darkness, to my left another machine gun opened fire, and its bullets followed the howling Russian as far as the earth embankment in front of the foxhole into which he finally plunged. From the hole, we could hear voices shouting, Jamansky, Jamansky! With a leap which looked beyond his capacities, the veteran propelled himself forward, hurling a grenade from his right fist. The object vanished into the darkness for two or three seconds. Then the hole was lit by a brilliant white light, and we heard the outcry of several voices for a moment of silence. We withdrew as fast as we could, keeping parallel to the barbed wire. Behind us, we could hear a rising tumult. Risking mines and bullets, we ran for a small hillock, and gasping our breaths, hastily attempted to organize a defensible position in a thicket. Idiots! The sergeant exploded, meaning Krauss and the veteran. I didn't give an order to fire. We'll never get out of this now! He was as scared as anybody else. But Grumpers asked for help, sergeant. Krauss answered. He was in bad trouble. An instant later, a dozen flares lit our surroundings as bright as day, and a Russian fuselage took the air all around us. The Russians were also heaving grenades at random, the way we would have done. We're finished, whimpered young Lindbergh. Quick, a shovel, shouted the suit dating. We gotta dig in or they'll slaughter us. Nobody move, the veteran commanded authoritatively. In our terror, we obeyed him. His voice sounded more confident than the sergeant's. We tried to freeze absolutely, even down to the fluttering of our eyelids. A flare burst into brilliant white light directly overhead, and anyone whose face wasn't buried in the ground could see every detail of our circumstances. Just beyond us lay the bodies of Grumpers and the Russian, and five or six foxholes preceding a V-shaped infantry position. Our flares lit the edge of the wood from which our adventures had begun. Luckily, the Russians nearest us hadn't noticed the rising ground which was giving us cover. However, the soldiers in the more distant position, which had seen the light of the flares, could see us. They began throwing grenades too, and they were using the superb Russian grenade throws. God, said the veteran, if they got those damn things, we've had it. We ought to dig, sniveled Lindbergh. Shut up. Dig with your belly if you like, but don't move anything else. If we play dead, maybe they'll think we are. Something fell with a dull thud on the other side of the hillock. Its crest disintegrated, and we were splattered by a rain of earth. There were no new flares coming over, and the ones falling were still fading. As usual, the Russians were shouting curses at us. Another grenade landed somewhere to our left, and we could hear the whistling fall of its fragments through the noise of the explosion. Someone lying beside the veteran groaned. Shut up! Hold it back! muttered the veteran between his clenched teeth. If they hear anything, that's it. He was talking to his number two man. The boy was clawing at his face, which was twisted with pain. His hands were trembling. Don't make a sound, said the veteran, putting his hand on the boy's forearm. Be strong! Grenades were still falling all around us. The boy clenched his face, and his eyes flooded with tears. He sniffed. Quiet! insisted the veteran. The flares died out and almost everything around us became pitch black. The Russians must have spotted another group of our men somewhat to the north of us. It was their turn to get the lights and the noise. Then we heard an other sounds directly ahead of us. By deliberately dialing our pupils as wide as we could, we were able to distinguish several men creeping forward parallel to our position. 
cold sweat trickled down our backs. The veteran was holding a large grenade about four inches from my nose. Once again we froze. The hunched figures came toward us as far as the barbed wire and we turned back. We all breathed again. The wounded boy buried his face in the ground to try to stifle his groans. They're just as scared as we are, said the veteran. Somebody orders them up here to see what's going on. So they take a few steps. Then they run back as fast as they can and they say they didn't see anything. It's almost dawn, whispered the non-com. I think we could stay here. It seems a pretty good spot. I don't, Sergeant. I think we should get out. Maybe you're right, you, he said, pointing to Halls. There's a hole about 20 yards from here, level with the barbed wire. You get over there. Halls and Lindbergh slid off like snakes. Where are you hurt? The veteran asked the wounded boy, touched him on the shoulder. The young man lifted his face, which was smeared with dirt and tears. I can't move. Something hurts here. He touched his hip. A splinter. Don't move. We'll send someone to help you. Yes, said the boy, thrusting his face back in the dirt. Our assault troops should be here in 10 or 15 minutes, if everything goes well. The horizon was beginning to turn pink. Soon the sun would be up. We, we walked feverishly. Isn't there going to be a bombardment first? Asked Kraus. Lucky there's not, said the veteran. We get it just as badly as the pop-offs. There won't be, said the sergeant. The first waves are supposed to take the enemy by surprise. We're here to neutralize the enemy defenses. But our fellows might mistake us for Russians and do us in. Exactly, said the veteran, laughing. Russian voices came to us in bursts, as clearly as if they were in the trench with them. At least they don't seem worried, the Czech remarked. What's the use of worrying? We'll be dead in an hour anyway, said the veteran as if he was thinking it aloud. The light was increasingly rapidly. Everything was still gray, but we could distinguish a portion of the Russian D position in line with the veteran's spun down machine gun, and lower down to the left, a motionless gray mass. Hals, Lindbergh, and the FN machine gun. You, young fellow, said the veteran, looking at me, you'll replace my number two man. Get over here on my left. Right. I said, warming my way toward him. A minute later, my nose was pressed against the metal of the FN's magazine. We could see most of the details of the Russian position a hundred yards ahead of us. From our hillock overlooking the enemy, we glimpsed momentary snatches of pale faces, like faces in a dream. It now seems to me astonishing that the Russians hadn't occupied our little hill. However, there were similar rises to the ground all around us, and they couldn't have occupied all of it. We were staring straight ahead when our leader's hand pointed to our rear left. Look, he said in almost full voice. We carefully turned our heads the way he was pointing and saw the bodies of many men slithering on the ground, breaking through the network of Russian protection. As far as we could see, the ground was covered with creeping figures. They're ours, said the veteran, and a faint smile crossed his face. Get ready to fire. If anyone moves in Ivan's hole, our leader added. Suddenly. Yeah. Alright. That was the bottom of 182. We'll continue with 183 later.